Hi everyone, this online lecture is the sequel to last week's online lecture in regards to speed training. Last week we covered the first six agenda items and today we will finish speed training by covering agenda items seven and eight. There are two general speed training goals. The first is the optimization of stride length and the optimization of stride frequency. With that, there are five components to assess and conduct a gap analysis on. The first and second are technically related, and that is the assessment of stride length and stride frequency, which you may need to outsource to a technical coach. The third component that you want to assess is top end speed. This is really evaluates the max force applied to the ground and the speed of energy breakdown or ATP breakdown. Fourthly, you want to assess the individual's rate of force development and this can be evaluated with a 0 to 5 meter and or 0 to 10 meter as well as specific intervals of distance. So you assess their speed over a given distance and this is really that very small amount of distance, 0 to 5 or 0 to 10 meters. And lastly, the fifth component to assess and conduct a gap analysis on is the change of direction ability. Acceleration and deceleration ability, both in a linear and multi-directional before we move into methods of developing speed, there are two fundamental speed training objectives. The first one is that you want to emphasize brief ground support times as a means of achieving rapid stride rate. Ultimately, you want to minimize the amortization phase through optimizing the stretch shortening cycle, so the reactive ability of your athlete. This really requires that high level of explosive strength, as well as developing systematically consistent exposure to speed and plyometric training, as well as properly designing a strength training program. The second fundamental speed training objective is to emphasize further development of the stretch shortening cycle as a means to increase the amplitude of impulse for each step of the sprint. Ultimately, you want to develop that eccentric strength during the pre-stretch. So what's been shown is that high achievers at high top end speed produce high forces in a short stance phase during the stretch shortening cycle. As well, what's been shown is that completing weightlifting movements and their derivatives are these key exercises in overloading the stretch shortening cycle with forces greater than those produced during an open sprint. As such, it's very important to develop the eccentric strength in your athlete by doing resisted exercise, specifically strength-based strength, uh, work. Now let's move into the five methods to develop speed. Firstly, no exercise improves running velocity more than maximal velocity sprinting. So you have to sprint to be fast. Ultimately, what happens when we're sprinting is we do these near max to max muscle activation, which really is a central nervous system activity. And this is called rate coding. So if you have multiple repetitions of max to near max, uh, sprinting, what you get is this rate code coding. Uh, when signal frequency reaches a threshold, you summate those. And so there's not much of a relaxation between st uh, stimulations. And as such, what you get is this incomplete relaxation, and it results in a more forceful contraction and greater rate of force development and subsequent contractions. This is also known as post-activation potentiation. A prime example of this is when you just lifted heavy weights in the gym and then you go out and you run up a, a flight of stairs. It seems like you're just floating up those stairs and you can do it so quickly. And this is because of post-activation potentiation, that there's not complete rest between subsequent um, contractions and so you have this summation happening in the nerve impulse. Thus, with chronic exposure to sprinting, what you see is huge improvements in the musculoskeletal control via the central nervous system. So you see these adaptations that are really neural adaptations, the ability to, for nerve transmission, but also the summation ability and post-activation potentiation. The second way to develop speed is by improving strength. And eccentric strength is developed firstly, then you want to convert that strength to a high rate of force development via plyometric training. Remember, strength training is really time under tension. So you want to maximize that time under tension by loading them with a slow eccentric load 
and really working on that, that eccentric strength. And then what you want to do is eventually convert that to power and rate of force development by moving the load quickly. Ultimately, as you can read on this slide, the transfer of the training effect to performance may result from similarities between movement patterns, peak forces, the rate of force development, acceleration and velocity patterns of an exercise and the sporting environment. So, so the specificity of training and overload is so important to ensure a high transferability to athlete performance within their field of play. The third method to develop speed is in developing specific strength through resisted or assisted training techniques. In the second method I just presented, the athlete developed eccentric strength. Now the strength is being trained through running specific movement patterns to develop sprint specific strength. This can be achieved in two ways, through resisted or assisted strength development. Let's talk about the resisted. Resisted means wearing weighted vests, using parachutes, doing hill climbs. This is adding resistance to speed and then having the person sprint. I used to love this type of training for hockey and speed development. I absolutely loved my weighted vest and I ran consistently with a parachute to have that resisted type of speed work. Training is using overspeed training. For example, this would be running downhill. Or for example, when I was a cyclist, I would pace behind uh, a motorbike. And this really helped me. This is called motor pacing, and it's commonly used in the sport of road cycling to help you get to a high speed with a high leg frequency. And this really trained the neuromuscular system. I used to love this technique of overspeed training because it helped me transfer to a race environment quite well. Or for, for example, for cycling based training, it would be riding with a lighter resistance or lighter gear and focusing on very high RPMs to get that overspeed of your legs and having them fire faster and contract faster to develop the neuromuscular system. This is a form of overspeed training through assistance, trying to run downhill to get your legs running faster. And eventually you'll adapt. The neuromuscular system will adapt. In summary from this slide, there are two types of methods to develop speed, one through resistant and one through assisted training techniques. This table provides a great overview of assistance and resistance speed development. You should be aware of some of the potential benefits, disadvantages, and practical uses, use suggestions for both types. You don't need to memorize this, but I want you to be familiar with it. This comes directly from the National Strength and Conditioning Association Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist textbook. The big issue is technique, which can be compromised with either type of resistant or assisted exercise. So you cannot use this type of training all the time. And it really is for that advanced um, speed development instead of for a beginner. As well, resisted exercise makes you strong, but not necessarily fast. So a balance is very important between this type of training and the other methods presented. The fourth method of developing speed is through plyometric training. And this is really all about the rate of force development and impulse at varying loads and this is through the activation of the stretch shortening cycle. One of the main chronic adaptations to plyometrics is the development of muscle stiffness, which potentially can increase or provide an advantage to sprint ability. Another long-term or chronic adaptation to plyometrics is neurological through the speed of neural transmission, which improves the rate of force development and impulse. And lastly, the fifth method to develop speed is mobility, which is the most overlooked method to develop speed. Remember, mobility is the freedom of an athlete's limb to move through a desired range of motion. And it's different than flexibility, as you can see here. Ultimately, the goal of sprinting is the athlete's ability to overcome the ground reaction forces in the shortest amount of time. And they may have energy leaks due to insufficient mobility, leading to a compromised joint freedom, misplaced forces, and thus dampened sprint speed, as well as a higher risk of injury. 
So a focus for coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, is to ensure that postural integrity is um, worked on before you start sprint training to make sure that the movement, that the athlete's mobility is such that they can actually optimize their stride length and stride frequency, reduce the risk of injuries, and optimize their sprint ability. So to summarize this online lecture, ultimately, you want to prescribe training specific to the adaptations that are desired. As well, speed comes from the effective application of force to generate high max forces, the rate of force development, and impulse. The goal of speed training is to really shift that force velocity curve to the left and upwards. As well, I presented five methods to train speed. First of all, you want to sprint. Second of all, you want to develop eccentric strength. Thirdly, utilize assisted and resisted modalities. Fourthly, incorporate plyometrics to increase the rate of force development and the stretch shortening cycle. And lastly, you want to ensure that the athlete has good mobility in the movement patterns of sprinting. Thank you very much for your attention, and that concludes our module on speed training.